Hey friends, it's Ro. Welcome back to my channel. Today we're going to do a review of episode two of the new based on a true life series called For Life produced by 50 Cent. Loosely based off of a true story of a man who was incarcerated unfairly for life in New York State. If you're interested in my review of season one episode two, it was so much better than the pilot which was amazing still in my book. Please keep watching. If you're new here, my name is Ro. I am the founder of an organization called Strong Prison Wives and Families, the author of a book called The Comeback Code, and I, I've been coaching prison wives and family members since 2009. We do not glorify or glamorize prison or prison wife life here, but I will help you set goals, attain them, and build self-confidence during this really lonely, depressing, and difficult journey. If it's your first time here, I would love if you could give this video a thumbs up, hit subscribe, and ring that bell to be notified every single time I post a new video every Monday, Wednesday, Friday. We have so many people who are fighting over first comment now. It makes my life to know that you guys like to watch my videos, like to comment, and like to try to be first. You're the cutest, the sweetest, and I appreciate each and every one of you. I wish I could get through the camera how much I genuinely do, but I do not want to make this about that. I have notes because on my first video where I reviewed the pilot, I went old school showed my age, and I took notes on a piece of paper with a pen, not on a rock with a chisel, but basically should have. I decided for this week to enter 2020 with the rest of you, and I took notes on my phone. So you won't hear me dropping the paper, it crinkling, the wind blowing it from the fan, and all of that not entertaining, but made for good bloopers stuff. So just to remind you, I'm not gonna get into anything about the actors, their names, where they're from, anything like that, because that's something you can Google yourself. I wanna tell you from my perspective as a prison wife, what I think of some of the scenes, if I think that they're realistic, if I think that they're completely made up. Just give you my reaction as somebody who's been involved with a man who was also sentenced unjustly to life but he's in federal prison. Then I picked one of your comments from last week's video that we'll talk about. And that's what I'll do with my review videos from For Life is I will always pick a comment from the episode before and we'll talk about it at the end of the video. And just so you guys know, I'm trying to post these every Monday because the show airs on Tuesday nights on ABC at 10 p.m. Eastern. If you like this, if you want me to keep reviewing, give me a thumbs up, let me know in the comments. If you're like, all right, enough of this, we get it, we're watching it, let me know that in the comments too because I always wanna make videos that you guys wanna watch. So one of the scenes, the attorney that sponsored Aaron Wallace, the main character, was coming into the prison. First of all, he was in his car, he was blasting a song in Italian, which I was like, oh my God, I loved every second of it. But when he went there, he kind of had like a heart to heart with him and he said something like, like slow down because Wallace is trying to sue the state because of his case. Obviously I'm par paraphrasing, but the point he was making was you are so brand new to this. You can't just come in guns blazing, doing something so self-righteous and suing the state. That would be like having a rookie trying to fire the coach of the Yankees or something along those lines. He's completely right. Unfortunately, law is a game. It's like a chess game and you have to really think through every single move. So although it sucks, it's just how it is. It's a life lesson. It's not even a jail lesson. You can't be so green at something and come in with this big cocky ego. I get where he's coming from. He's like, listen, it's my life. Every minute in here is a minute too long. Yeah, but you have to know how to play the game. I had to be taught that lesson from Adam too. Slow your roll. As the episode unfolds, Aaron Wallace goes to see this is crazy knowing the episode. So again, quick, if you've not seen the episode and you wanna see it, there are going to be spoilers in here. Consider this a spoiler alert again. So Wallace is getting on the bus to go, I think to court, I don't remember. I, one of the guards starts taunting him and he's making these comments about you're gonna help this guy and you're gonna work with Wild Bill to get that guy out. And he starts saying these really harsh things and basically picking on him. Yes, 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 it happens all the time. Guards will taunt the crap out of inmates because they know at the end of the day, they have the power. They have things like pepper spray. They have things like handcuffs. They have weapons like the hole where they can throw somebody in and leave them there for a really long time. Having a guard taunt an inmate is extremely common. Totally true, totally would happen. Another scene is when Aaron Wallace goes to visit the guy he's trying to help get out of the hole, which is solitary confinement. Wild Bill's guy 
named Joey Knox get out of the hole. So he goes to visit Joey Knox and you could tell from the minute he's trying to get in there, Joey Knox doesn't want to have any part of it. He doesn't want to have anything to do with it. Basically like get out. And he said, how did you even get here? Who sent you? And he said, Wild Bill sent me. Like basically he's your leader and he's trying to help you get out. And you can tell that Joey Knox his whole persona changed and he didn't want to have anything to do with it. He got really anxious. So in my notes, as the episode is airing, I'm taking notes in real time. My notes, I say, it seems like he doesn't want to come out because he fears the shot caller. So they show you why he ended up in the hole. What happened was they're on the unit and all of a sudden he goes up to a guard totally unprompted and he just starts beating him up. Now this happens very frequently. Either there is some sort of vendetta like the guard we were just talking about before who taunts an inmate. My thought was you could tell that he was nervous. He went up to the bars and he asked the cop for something. You could tell in the video footage that they were watching back Aaron and the warden. You could tell he was asking for a favor, asking for something, saying something. You could tell he was in distress by his face and the cop ignored him. Out of nowhere, like either it was the following morning, something like that, he just totally beats the crap out of the cop right in the open. From what I've seen, from my experience, usually that is somebody who is trying to check into protective custody without having to check in. Because if you go check into PC, then you look like a wimp. It's not a good look for you with your shot caller if you're a part of an organized group of people. You hear what I'm saying? A lot of people will start a fight out in the open so they can be taken to solitary confinement because that is their way of getting themselves into protection. It's their own type of protective custody. A lot of times that happens because you have a drug debt or because you have messed with the wrong person because you hear that somebody has a hit out for you and you need to get protection. One of my friends, unfortunately, she used to have a code word with her husband because he didn't wanna have to be the one to check in because it wasn't a good look for him. He just had his hand in too many different things, not necessarily the best person in the world, but he would call her and he would say this certain phrase that they knew between the two of them and she would know to call the prison and say he needed to be checked into PC. Did it happen every time? Probably not, but I don't really know. I didn't really keep in touch with them after that. So something happens with Jasmine and Marie, her mother, Aaron's wife, was like, I'm so sorry for all the extra stuff that ends up on your plate. In other words, because her dad's in prison. She wanted to introduce her boyfriend to her father, but the boyfriend was kind of hesitant because he didn't tell his parents about his 16 year old pregnant girlfriend's father being in jail. That's not a good look for him to his parents. She was stuck in the middle. Jasmine was stuck in the middle of it all. It is not her fault that her dad's in jail. Jasmine said, that's okay because I'm strong enough. I can handle it. Damn straight. That is so true. These prison kids have to go through so much. They have to endure so much, not only at home and the emotions of not having your loved one there, but also if they're in the closet at school, having their friends find out, being bullied. It's just so scary and sad for them. Before I got back in touch with Adam, my sister was a teacher and she taught young little first grade kids. And she had a student who came from as she called it, the other side of the tracks. And it was like, well, of course he's gonna be delayed. Of course he's gonna be emotional. Of course he's gonna be this, that, and the other because he's the kid whose dad is in jail. Ugh, what kind of family does he come from? Could be any one of us. So another scene, one of Aaron's friends is mad at him because he's working with the white gang, he's working with the warden, and now he's working with Wild Bill. His friend says to him, you're so damn radioactive, I shouldn't even be talking to you. And that's so true, so that's prison slang. What I've always heard is people say, he's hot, she's hot. Meaning, somebody is onto them, they are openly being investigated, staff is watching them for a move, there's a gang in there that wants to beat them up, something like that, I need to stay away from him, he's hot. That is what they say. And that's what this guy was trying to say. You're so damn radioactive. You've got your hand in so many different pots. You're involved in so many different people. This is bound to backfire and explode on you. Everything you do inside of prison, you are living in a glass house. You're living in a fishbowl. Everybody watches your every single move. So they're all watching how you move. They're also watching who you move with. This guy's like, I can't be near you. I could tell you Adam had to get away from people a lot when they're hot. He had to kick them out of programs. They could have been friends at one point, but you got yourself into some trouble knowing what you were doing. That's on you, bro. It's every man for himself. 
unfortunately, it's just the way that it exists. So that is so true for somebody to say, like, you're so radioactive, I shouldn't even be talking to you. You are so hot, you're on fire, basically. At one point, Jasmine's boyfriend goes to the prison to visit Wallace to meet him for the first time, and he's there by himself. I kind of call BS on that one because minors cannot go to visit by themselves. Now that said, they don't have to be with their guardian, but they do have to be with a guardian. So for example, my friend took her boyfriend's, not married, so that she has nothing legally in relation to this kid, but she took her boyfriend's son to visit because his mom wanted nothing to do with going. So you could do that, but he, you can't just drop him off and, and let him go into visit by himself. That is not how it works, at least with my experience in federal prison. Minors have to be accompanied by an adult. Now, just wanna throw in there, I, I don't know if he's 18 and the daughter is 16 or 17, but I don't think that they would put that on TV because that's not legal either. During this visit, an inmate came up to Wallace and he gave him a message from somebody. That is so something that could happen because here's the thing, if there's an inmate in the hole, if there's an inmate on a different unit that can't get to another inmate but needs to give him a message, then people can pass it through visit because there are certain areas of the prison that are commonplace and you could see people from different units. One would be the yard, if it's not separated. Another would be the chow hall, if you're usually in passing because they call one unit at a time, at least where Adam is, to go down to chow. Another would be religious services. So a lot of people will meet up in the chapel while religious services are going on just because it's a place that is neutral, that people from different units can go. Another would be visit. So that's why a lot of visit rooms, they have rules where inmates can't talk to each other or inmates' family members cannot talk to the inmates that they are not visiting. Has it happened before? Yeah. Have I done it before? Yeah. It's just a risk that you take. You might get called out. They might yell at you. And if you don't stop, you're going to get terminated and kicked out. And some cops might just let it fly. So during that same exchange, this guy comes over, he gives the message. This whole drama erupts right in front of him. And he's just kind of sitting there watching it happen. Aaron realizes once it's over, crap, this kid is sitting in front of me. And so he says to him, don't worry about that. That was nothing. It's just prison politics. And the boy says back to him, I honestly don't even know what just happened. Oh my God, true, true, true. Prison politics are a thing of their own. And I'm gonna tell you guys something. I know a lot, a lot of women, especially significant others on the outside, they thrive off of it. They see that the drama, they wanna get involved. They wanna be part of the politics. Ugh, it makes me wanna throw up when that happens. It is not your place to get involved in prison politics. First of all, you're not one of the guys in there. And unless you wanna confirm his stay, making a reservation for the next time he goes back in there after he gets out, no. You need to try to be his tether to the real world, to get him away from the politics, it's not hot, it's not glamorous, it's not cool, it is not Bonnie and Clyde. You don't need to get involved in the politics because you're not an inmate. So I love that this kid didn't understand. It's not worth it. It is weird. Usually it's very violent. Usually it's so twisted and it's all a mind game. Why do you want to be involved in that? I'm sorry I'm so passionate about this, but this is literally something I just had to deal with. A big fire this morning that happened on one of our Strong Prison Wives and Families Facebook pages, a support group for prison wives and family members, because people wanted to get involved in drama. And I'm telling you right now, that can get your inmate hurt or killed. Don't do it. We don't have too many more scenes to cover, but this is the part where the show took a little twist and got really juicy. Joey Knox, who's in the hole, it comes out that him and his celly were in a romantic relationship. Well, that explains why Wild Bill was trying to get him out of the hole. They're involved in an affiliated group of people that has zero tolerance for any ethnicity that's not like them, for any race that's not like them, for LGBTQ. They are very violent. They're just vile, disgusting, horrible people. Wild Bill, the shot caller for this group of people, wanted that guy out of the hole so they could take care of him because one of their own cannot be a traitor like that. Again, ridiculous. That completely explains why Joey Knox ran up to the gate, was like, help, help, help. They would not help him. So he attacked the guard for seemingly no reason, 
The reason was to protect his own life. He needed to check into PC. He wasn't getting checked in. He needed protection because they were going to come after him after they found out that he was in that romantic relationship with his cellmate. And it was like, click all together, ding, ding, ding. Prison wife experience, I knew that he checked in for a reason, that he jumped that guard for a reason, because this is just real life. And then it comes out in another scene that he joined that affiliated group of people, starts with a G, the word, four letters. He joined that for protection, to basically hide his identity as a homosexual man or a bisexual man. He decided to join that group of people because in jail, he was scared. In prison, a lot of men choose to stay in the closet because it's dangerous for them to be out of the closet in a male prison. I mean, to the point where this guy had tattoos on his face and everything like that. First of all, it is very, very common for majority of people to get clicked up and affiliated with a four letter word G group of people for protection. And not only is it racial affiliations, racial groups. It is also religious groups. So a lot of people find God in jail and click up with, let's say, the Christians or the Muslims, because that is also its own little four-letter G word. You will also be protected if you're in a group of, let's say, Christians or if you're in a group of Muslims. It probably doesn't sound like it makes sense, but that's just prison politics and how it works. So I have a lot of women that reach out to me like he's being weird. All of a sudden he just found God, which he, he did inside of jail. That's beautiful. But I've had a couple of wives like it's not him. It's just really disturbing. The way that he's speaking to me is just weird. Or he's asking me to wear Muslim headscarf, a Muslim attire to prison visit. I am not even like that, but he's kind of demanding that I do it. It's more that he wants people to hear him say that. It's more that he wants people to see you coming in like that. It gives the illusion that he is genuinely interested in being in this group of people or being in this religion so he's protected. He joined that group of people for protection and he says that he didn't even want to do it. He didn't even want to be involved in that group. When Wallace gets him out because he wins the case and he says to him like he's so grateful and this and that, and Wallace kind of throws, I don't know, paperwork or something at him. And he said, just because you didn't want to do it doesn't mean that you didn't do everything to get yourself there. So in other words, just because you didn't want to be there, you have all of the markings. You did the violent acts that you were told to do so you could be protected. And you hurt other people that are like you. I can't get down with that. I helped you because it was the right thing for me to do. But I'm not your boy. <laughs> we're not boys. We're not cool. Totally get it. Happens all the time. While the correctional officers were being questioned about this case and what happened and knowing that this came out, one of the cops, the one that was taunting Wallace in the beginning, so clearly now we know he's taunting Wallace because he knows this piece of information that the, that guy was hooking up with his roommate and he wants him to stay in there, but he doesn't know that Wallace doesn't know this. So that guy is just like typical drink the Kool-Aid CO. Us against them, flex your power muscles, that kind of thing. So he's in there and they're showing him, telling his other cops, you don't have to answer that. So they're all lying to cover each other. And then he says, we don't want to speak without our union reps. My God, that is painfully true. It's very common for not only correctional officers and people that work in prison, but people that work for the government in union type of positions to, I, that's not part of my job description. I'm not doing that. I'm calling my union rep. It boils Adam's blood because it comes to the point where it's like, I'm not gonna unlock the door. And all you need to do is go past that door so you can get your legal information. Not part of my job description, not covered by the union. Cause they're just being jerks. The warden is saying to Wallace, we can get Joey Knox to a place where he feels safe. Do I think that's true? Eh, it's a maybe. There are checks and balances in place. There's what you call a yard separate or a yard separation, where if I feel threatened by somebody, I can go to the warden and say, Marissa Smith is a threat to me. So I don't want to be on the same yard as her because of X, Y, and Z. And if that's legitimate, according to staff administration, the warden, which in some cases it's faked by the inmate, they just need an excuse to leave. They don't want to be around this person. And in a lot of cases, it is legitimate. There are also 
things called dropout yards. And by the way, when I say yard, I just mean another facility, another location. It's just slang on the yard. It's just, that's what they call it. These are facilities that are known to house people that drop out of groups that they're affiliated with, or maybe people with very sensitive crimes that feel like they are at risk every single day of being a victim of violence if they stay at a regular yard. At a higher level security federal prison, it is very likely that you are going to walk the yard with somebody who knows that story. Word travels extremely fast in that system. And that's why I was saying earlier, don't get involved in the politics because really, do you wanna be responsible for somebody losing their life? And if you say, yeah, I wanna be involved in that prison politics, my friend, I will gladly give you give you. I won't trade you. I won't charge you. I will give you my lifelong membership to this club that you think is such an elite experience. It's not cool, glamorous, or fun to get involved in prison politics. Anyhow, yes, it happens. You send people to yards where they will feel safer. Are they always safe? Not necessarily. Are they always sent there? Not necessarily. A lot of times, people will be put on yards purposely by administration to be taken care of. Yes, because administration doesn't like them. Administration doesn't like what they did. Oh, he did X, Y, and Z to X, Y, and Z child. You want him walking this yard? They know that there's people, young kids there, like this Joey Knox, that need to make a name for themselves, that need to be protected, that are more than willing, they're waiting for this type of an opportunity to present itself. It's sad, but that's just how it is. In another scene inside the courtroom, it comes out that the DA tampered with evidence and he also fabricated witnesses, meaning he completely made up witnesses that weren't real, that weren't there, etc. Yeah, true, happens all the time. And while this is taking place, Wallace's pregnant young daughter is there. And she starts sobbing at this point. And Wallace looks at his daughter and he said, please don't cry, please don't cry. And I got a little emotional at this point because that happens all the time. And I think that that's the reality to our loved ones that they can't be there to support us. They can't be there to help us. It actually happened to me in a situation in visit with Adam where we're not allowed to touch. They took away all of our contact. So we had to sit across from each other with this tiny little wooden table between us. We weren't allowed to touch each other. And I was telling him a situation that was really upsetting me. It was really emotional. And he went to go grab my hands to console me as his, my husband. And he just goes, and he was so frustrated that he couldn't touch me. So I get that. And the last scene that stood out to me that I wanted to bring up is I think the most important and realistic scene in this whole show. Marie, who's Wallace's wife, very often shields her husband from information. She doesn't tell him a lot of things, especially emotional things, because she doesn't want to kick him while he's down. He's locked up in there, facing everything in there, etc. Absolutely, 100%, yes, that happens all the time. We tend to hide stuff from them and shield them from stuff on the outside that we think is going to be emotional for them. Adam can't stand that, and he knows that life does not stop going on while he's inside. So if you don't tell him something's going on until after the fact, because you have to tell him, let's say somebody gets sick and they pass away, and then all of a sudden you tell him they pass away, he could have had time to rekindle a relationship with that person or something along those lines. So I tend to try to tell him things when they happen when he needs to know them, if that makes sense. If it's something that I could take care of on my own, if it's something that he'll never have to know or something like that, fine. I should probably explain the scene first. I just got too distracted moving all over the house. Jasmine's boyfriend calls Wallace and he's like, listen, what happened today was awful for her. She told you she was fine, but she's not fine. I'm taking care of her, she'll be okay, but she doesn't tell you a lot of stuff. She got a scholarship to go to college in California. She stayed here because of you. She makes the five hour drive every single week or month or whatever it is to see you. It's draining on her, it's grueling on her. She's stopping her life. She's not experiencing life at her age as a young adult because of you. Not only did he tell him that where everybody else shielded him from that and Wallace handled it beautifully. He said, I want you to work with me and help me make sure that she does, that I'm not stopping her from doing things. So he said, well, please help me with that. We'll work together on that, which was great. But also a lot of us as 
prison wives and family members, especially significant others, kind of put ourselves in our own little prison with inmates and we don't allow ourselves to experience life because we think they're in there, they're miserable, they're not celebrating, I need to suffer too just like them. We'll go into that more another time. I've talked about it more on other videos, but this video has gotten really long and there was something really juicy that happened in the coming attractions. But again, this video has gotten so long that I will wait until it takes place on the show next week. We'll talk about that in our episode three of For Life season one review. The comment of last week, I was going to read verbatim to you guys. Unfortunately, I'm on the phone that I was using to read it to you. Basically in a nutshell, I believe it was Kelly who left this comment and she, she does not have a loved one in prison. She said while this show was on, she was telling her husband like, that's not real. That's not true. That's not going to happen. And he was like, is there something that you need to tell me? And so we were laughing and she pointed out something that happened in the visit room of the pilot episode where Wallace went back to the housing units and then he came back into the visit room to bring Marie something. First of all, that's never going to happen. If you leave visit, you're done. Your visit is literally terminated the minute you walk out, at least where I go in federal prison. He comes back in and he tries to hand Marie an envelope and the cops like visit is over. Don't do it. And they both just stand there looking at each other. And then he kind of runs up and he hands it to her and she accepts it. And the cops were like upset, but they were like, come on, go visit's over. And he was like, sorry, sorry. It's just a signed report card for our daughter or pictures for our daughter or something like that, a letter for our daughter. I forgot to mention this in my pilot episode videos and I'm so glad she made this comment because I wanted to. That said, if I forgot anything in episode two, please comment it because regardless, I'm picking a comment from this video to talk about on episode three review. But that absolutely would never hands down happen. First of all, she would never be allowed to bring anything into the visit room. I know New York state is different. Maybe they can. I know that they're allowed to send packages. I don't know if they're allowed to bring packages. Way back in the day when Adam was in New Jersey State Prison for a couple of years, back then they were allowed to bring food to visit. That was stopped a long time ago and in the feds, absolutely not. If that took place where I go, he would have been tackled. He would have been dragged to probably a dry cell, which we could talk about what that is. If you guys want to know all about a dry cell and what that is, what they do there, I will definitely do a video about that, but it's basically the whole on steroids advanced and could have potentially been charged, could have potentially caught another case or more time. She potentially could have been arrested, but at the very minimum, he would have been tackled, beat and dragged back to the hole for sure. Without a doubt, hands down where I go. There are no handoffs. We do not bring anything in. She wouldn't have probably been able to bring it into the visit room at all unless she stuffed it. I mean, a, an envelope this big, I don't know where she would have stuffed it, but yeah, no. So good catch, Kelly. I love it. You guys keep staying strong. Keep loving strong. Keep supporting one another through this journey. And also keep watching this amazing show and commenting and letting me know what you think. You are one day closer to this all being behind you. And God knows me and Adam are too. Lots of love from my heart and his heart to all of yours. I'll see you beautiful ladies and gentlemen in the next one. Bye guys. <laughs>